This week, we are going to be starting today, we will be covering Isao, Isao Tomita, Tomita, the pioneering uh, Japanese electronic musician um, from, you know, starting in probably about 68, when, you know, the famous Switched On Bach album came out and changed the world as we know it. He heard that and he was like, I have to try to make I have to do this. something like this. Well, as I heard him explain it, um, he had been composing music for orchestra. And we can get into his biography and early life and all that kind of stuff. But he had been composing music for orchestra and he felt like he had hit a wall with the types of sounds that you can get from an orchestra. He was explaining it like a painter or a sculptor. Um, at that time, you know, that was, you know, modernist um, approaches were, were kind of really out there in terms of painting and, and, and the art world. And he has a degree in art history, so it makes sense that he used that analogy. He got sick of the typical timbres. Yeah, he was saying, like, you could, you know, grind down concrete and use it in your paint in those days. And he was looking for some way to expand his palette. And so when he heard Switched on Bach and learned about the Moog synthesizer, he knew that was his path. That was his cosmic path that he had to take. I find it really interesting that he is also someone who did not study formally composition, music, instruments, you know, playing. He took some composition lessons when he was in college, but he did get a degree in art history. And, um, you know, that is similar to um, some other people like Xenakis um, that we talked about He recently. played as a child though, right? There's not a lot of, mm. um, really, you know, biographical information on his early life. Yeah, I didn't really see he, much. Um, he was born in 1932, mm -hmm. and his dad took him to China. His dad was a doctor, I believe, um, and he went to China for the first eight, nine years of his life, and he didn't have access to that kind of schooling, is how he described it. And obviously the war was happening, um, and it sort of impeded his ability to study music. So he said the basics of composition and um, music studies, he, he didn't get that mm. at a young age. Um, gotcha. But then they went back to Japan in 1940, or 39. Mm. The war wasn't quite over. Oh no, it was just, just picking up. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, he was explaining that in Japan they were very, very closed to any sort of Western influence. Mm. So the only music that he heard and, you know, feel free to chime in. We know the same information at this point. Um, the only information, uh, the only uh, music that he, they heard was war songs. There were parades, you know, there were, you know. He said that some of it was. Brass bands and, and Okay, like. but a lot of it was not his idea of good music. Yeah. So he um, grew up with this very, you know, patriotic music and um, very uh, closed off uh, from the rest of the world and it was because of the war and the U.S. occupation of Japan that he was exposed to Western music and that excited right. him you know he was spoke positively of that and I'm, but I'm sure that you know many actually looked at that as a negative thing like you know it was like being pushed well on yeah being occupied forced yeah you know, to well it wasn't allowed it wasn't they weren't allowed to listen to western music they weren't allowed to play western music but the u.s forces were um transmitting western music over their radios and i think the way he explained it was that they were you know wherever the troops were there would be like someone with a radio transmitting music behind them. Mm -hmm. And I believe he also said that they, you know, him and his family would have the radio on, and I'm sure other families too, during the war time because they didn't know, you know, were they going to be bombed? You know, what was the latest information they needed to know? So they were always tuning into the radio and trying to get that interference. And, and they were hearing the, the Western music that was being transmitted as kind of like the interference that they were hearing. 
in yeah. between. So that's how he got exposed to jazz and popular music. He went to and uh, studied art history in college, and while he was there, he also took some private composition lessons. But that's all. And then right out of college, he got a job composing for film and TV at the, you know, as part of what would be like the BBC of Japan, the NHK radio. And was he still composing uh, for orchestra at that point? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So I guess the most common thing for film and So it's TV not like he recorded a demo and got... No. Yeah. I, and I don't know if there was a mentor involved that got him a job. It didn't say, like, he started out at the bottom and he was getting people coffee. Like, it was just like, nope, he got his first composing gig. And then he was scoring films and TV, and that was his job. That was his life. Again, how do these things happen? We need more detail. doesn't <laughs> seem real. Things are not like that anymore. <laughs> right. It doesn't, but it does because you hear so many stories like that from that era, you know, where yeah. it's like this person just... They just, like, walked in and got ...happened to be, you know, at this place at this time, you know, right place, right time, and, you know, that decided, you know, the, their career. Okay, he's born in 1932, so by 1955, he's working as a composer. In 1956... He composed the theme music for the Japanese Olympus gymnastics team when they went to Australia, 1956. That's a pretty big gig to get, like, right out the gate. Yeah. Right out of college. For sure. Um, and then it kind of jumps from there. Like, I guess for the next 10 years, he was doing compositions for film and TV. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, got really into the animation. So uh, an interview that we saw with him. Tell me more about this animation. Uh, this sort of maybe 30-year-old generation of a person was interviewing him, saying that, like, yes, Tomita is known for this amazing electronic music around the world. But growing up in Japan, they were hearing these crazy sounds that he was composing in TV shows, in cartoons, in anime. And um, that really reminded me of what a lot of people who grew up in England say about hearing Doctor Who and all the crazy things that were happening on the, like, Saturday morning cartoon shows because of the BBC Radio Bono workshop. Right. And so this, this younger gentleman was saying that they grew up hearing the sounds of Tomita without knowing that, that he was the one behind right. it. Right, yeah, that was definitely, you know, kind of a tie-in, I would say, you know, to these European... Yeah, so that was something I didn't know. ...tape musicians, especially mm -hmm. the UK... Um, yeah, that that's definitely some crossover information. Yeah, so, so it's interesting because he's not someone who studied electrical engineering. You know, some people mm. that we've studied have said they've got their degrees as electricians or in, like, the radio arts or whatever that might have been at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe some composition studies in there. But he got into electronic music just being a composer for orchestra and just being somebody who was really chasing sound like the the theme that we have through all of these people that we study is that they were just desperate for something new and they heard a little glimmer of it and they grabbed a hold and i think you know based on what we've heard um had he not have found uh the moog synthesizer i don't mm -hmm. know that his flame would have lit as bright yeah i wonder what direction he would have gone but you know, cosmic magic happened, and he heard the Switch On Bach album. And again, I don't know how that happened. I'd like to know, but I guess it was just because it was so prolific and it was everywhere. I feel like you'd still have to have it suggested to you by a friend. Well, he was a composer. He did conduct orchestras, and yeah. Bach was a composer, and so maybe yeah. So I can see how that was like. It was it suggested was to him by a friend, or you know, it could have even across his plate in a magazine that he reads. He must have had a very competitive spirit because he claims that the reason he had to get a Moog and make his own version of what Wendy Carlos was doing is because he felt really like competitive about it. He felt like he needed to do his version of that. Like, oh, if that can be done, I can do it too. Uh, so he went, I actually just found this out. He had to go to New York to get the Moog. They couldn't ship it. So he had to, like, go to New York. They're, they weren't, like, taking orders all over the world at this time. This is, I want to say go, this is 1968, 1969. Acquire it. He 
he had to go find, find a and way it was to made it. like custom for him right yeah. like it wasn't an exact moog 3 it was a little bit more customized mm -hmm. than that and i guess at this time and maybe inspired by getting it was a modular right yes yeah absolutely it was the only thing they, thing they were making. The time, yeah. <laughs> so this was, you know, a little bit more customized for him, and he was building a home studio. Again, I don't think anyone in Japan was had a home electronic music studio. I think he was right. the first and to do so this. So there was something about that that probably lit the fire, you know. Yeah, for him he to, he was on a, a warpath war to yeah. be the I'm first sure. to do. I all mean, these think things. about it. Like a trip to the U.S. at yeah, that time. Yeah, I think he was getting paid really. Commercial well flight was as a composer in its infancy at that point. I know, we always talk about like the people that I always study try to during this that era in. that like flew a lot and we're like, oh, that must have been really scary. Yeah, and expensive. Like very expensive. Extremely expensive, you know, especially for a, um, you know, he would have to cross the Pacific, probably land in California, California and, then and then fly to cross anywhere. country. Yeah. You know, that's... That's a long, that probably took him a couple days back right. then. And so to go through all that, just there weren't to, like a lot of connecting flights all the time. To meet up with uh, Robert Moog. Yeah, apparently he thought it was really cool that he was like in a field. He said it was like in the middle of nowhere. Right. That they were building these synthesizers. Well, was he probably thought it was going to be in like New York City. Mm -hmm. So he got his Moog, got, somehow got it on the plane with him back to Japan. And then when he got to Japan. He probably had to make separate arrangements, I would think. No, he, 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 he and himself him. took the Moog with him. <laughs> On the flight. I guess it broke down. They and probably broke it down for In him. cases and yeah. stuff. When they got to Japan, the customs in Japan would not let him take this. They stopped him. They stopped the whole deal. They said, this is not a musical instrument. We don't believe you. Probably thought it was some sort of weapon. Yeah. And he um, apparently had his copy of Switched On Bach with him and was showing them the cover and saying, this is a musical instrument, but... That wasn't enough. I heard a twist to the story. I thought that was the end of the story, but then I heard a twist to the story. Uh, I'm just going to say, like, you know, first of all, like, who brings a little bit of their record he's collection? He's got his record collection with him at all times. With I him? I guess that was a thing back then. Maybe he was worried. Maybe he really thought. He might have bought a copy he specifically that they were for this to question purpose. Him. Yeah, that makes sense. Or, okay. you know, he was probably gone for a while. This probably wasn't like a big, quick turnaround trip, so maybe right. he had some records with him. It's not like yeah. you could bring your iPod. Maybe he couldn't get the record in Japan. We have a lot of questions <laughs> about the Switch on. As We've usual. been like really focusing on Switch on Bach. But the twist is that he had to actually call Robert Moog, and they had to send a picture to the Japanese customs people of someone playing the Moog as an instrument. Now you can just be like, look at my phone. They had to like, someone. that was pretty fax like fax machine. Them? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they sent it. It had to have been fax. Mm -hmm. So he then, eventually, they let him take the Moog. And he brought it back to his home studio that he was building. And apparently he got super obsessed and like didn't stop. Leave. Yeah, yeah, like just didn't eat, didn't sleep. I, I think it was for a year and a half that he, basically, there was no manual. And there was no one to teach him. He said that they taught it. They it was like signal flow. Like they at least mm -hmm. explained, you know, like how to like get sound. There was like a sound. schematic, maybe. Right, like kind of like a, they call them block diagrams, where it's like this into this into that will make you have a sound that your keyboard can control, kind of thing, you know. So it gave you like the basic signal flow. But, you know, definitely no, like, this is how to make a dog bark, you know, like, or yeah. whatever. I, I mean, it was <laughs> sort of an open-ended thing because they didn't really know what people were going to use it for. I, yeah, apparently he was very proud of being able to not sleep and just work on music 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not healthy. It'll catch and up with you. He did have a heart condition, and that's usually a, a related issue. Mm. Um, but he, obviously, he spent... Time he did his wood shedding with the Moog and he made his own version of Switched On Bach called Switched On Rock, where he did covers of like Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel. It's called Switched On Rock Electric Samurai. If 
by Isao Tomita. I so. can see that having the capability of being way more popular than Switch on Bach, even though. Uh, I but that know it really, wasn't. like him making that, like propelled him. So mm. that got released in the U.S. in 1972. And he and said it was climbing the charts, right? It, well, that was actually the, the follow up. Oh, that was the follow up. But this one was what sort of cemented him as an electronic music pioneer. So this got him the awareness that he existed. And I don't know who released it. I know more about his follow-up album. Um, but that one, um, let's see if it says it in here. It says it's kind of like some tongue-in-cheek stuff in there. So it's when you listen to it, you'll obviously recognize the songs right away. Mm -hmm. But he takes the sound design in a different direction. Um, and it's not like it's that much later than when these songs came out. There's some Elvis on there, too. It's kind of funny. Right. Like, if you're listening to it from just the sound design perspective, you can, it, you know, I have a lot of respect for it. You know, obviously, you can hear how much time he spent with his instrument to get it to do those things. But it's also kind of funny. There's a lot of, like, vowel-like, duck-like sounds like where the filter is being automated and it's like wow, 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 wow right so it probably started with this album because these songs do have vocals mm -hmm. he is known for using the synthesizer to replicate vocals right. better than anyone i don't think anyone had done that yet mm -hmm. so this whole idea of vocalization was was kind of groundbreaking um, and, you know, quickly following up that album, he released um, Dancing on Snowflakes, which is covers of Debussy songs. So he took this idea of what Wendy Carlos was doing, taking music people already know and replicating it like she was doing it note for note. But he explained that he picked composers to copy or I don't know, copy cover. Yeah, he was covering that them. weren't so linear. Like he he compares it to art a lot, which now that I know that he has a degree in art history, that makes a lot makes more sense. Makes a lot more sense. Bach was like a line drawing, which we also know like a lot of composers are inspired by his sort of mathematical approach, and Tomita had a much more like impressionistic painter approach, which he aligned with uh, Debussy on, right? Right, because he's an impressionist uh, composer. Um, which requires more color and timbre work with the synthesizer that is a lot more emotional than let me create the sound of a tuba and have it play the exact notes, note for note. He was creating an impressionistic painting with, yes. with the Moog, and no one had done that before. Right, and it was, evident, it was super evident, you know, for somebody who appreciates good sound design with synthesizers, mm -hmm. uh, I think that Tomita is a really good sound programmer. Like, he really woodshedded, um, you know, well with his time, you know, with the Moog. Like, you know, his, the sounds that he made, like the whistle sound, with like the pink, he explained, like the yeah, pink noise really with cool. the resonance. Mm -hmm. You know, which is definitely something you can't really do on a bukla, like in its mm -hmm. typ typical uh, configuration, um, which is kind of sad. But like it is, you know, he did a really good job of that sound. He did some bell-like tones, which is something you can really get into uh, in bukla territory pretty easily. Um, I would say that's a lot more on the West Coast side of, of sound design. But he um, made his own kind of clangorous bell tone type sounds and i was telling jack yeah earlier, he's very known for these things that weren't the synthesizer was not being used in this way i feel like he was an early adapter um of the the shimmer reverb sound that's something that brian ito gets credited with mm -hmm. a lot um well, it's and, definitely a thing and it's more of like a mid to late 70s ish 80s you know kind of uh, vibe um, but I heard elements of that in uh, Tomita's early work, you know, where I was like, oh, wow, like he, I feel like he's creating the shim, shimmer verb sound, which he definitely said that in the interview. So he knows, you know, oh, I, I guess know what that. that is. But, you know, he was, I feel like he was creating it by combining sounds, which, you know, we haven't really talked about yet. 
But yeah. that was one of his methods um, that, that I think he was really so well known So part of for. how he was able to create more color in the sound and more depth because he was also trying to emulate the sounds of flutes and violins and things in certain aspects of these uh, recordings that he was doing, these covers he was making of Debussy's music. Um, but he was much more interested in coloring the tone and giving it richness and depth, which he created mostly with tape. Using a tape machine, he would make up to a hundred tracks of one sound that he was layering to create the depth that he was looking for. If you've ever recorded to tape, you know, each time you record a layer of sound, it adds, you get the hiss too, you know? So that's, that's part of the thing. It's like, yeah, people say, you know, with tape machines, you know, you only have four tracks, but you can bust tracks around and that's how the Beatles did it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so you can get, you know, quite the orchestration build up that way. Um, but your nemesis in that regard is, is noise, is hiss. Right. And he said that he, actually learned to play with like noise reduction on noise reduction off for certain passages to almost like accentuate the sound that might have actually been how he got some of those shimmer verb sounds mm -hmm. you know maybe there might have been was, a lot of happy accidents right maybe he was like pitching you know stuff up or down to like you know get a certain effect and that's how you get the the shimmer he was processing sound more like a painter mixes paints. Yeah. You know, like I, I feel that like that must be where that the, that comes in. His right. Art history background. His art background, I think, you know, it's so prominent in the way that he addressed music. You know, and I think that one of the things I've run into, at least, you know, with people and you know, people who've gone to school for music and composition and things is like they kind of get pigeonholed a little bit in their thinking. Um, and I find that, you know, bands, for example, like I brought up Wire the other day, they were, they all knew each other from art school. You know, I think right. James from Broadcast went to art school. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like a lot of my favorite musicians, um, didn't have a music background or studies in music, go the art route because I feel like the foundations of art will give you the tools that you need to be a creative musician. Think, as well as not being pigeonholed by the music theory that just gets crammed down your throat. If so, yes, I, now I'm remembering what Tamita said about that. So he was saying that, you know, because he didn't have the formal training, um, he thought that that was actually a good thing and helped him be innovative, but that you need to have the basic tools and techniques and understanding. It's not a so bad idea. So he was explaining like Picasso, can make abstract, you know, work that he did that no one had ever seen before because he knew how to make a simple drawing. And he knew those basic rules and techniques. Knew how to break the rules. Exactly. I enjoyed uh, that. Tomita, because he um, made this, these covers albums, right, with the Moog, um, and that was already successful because of Wendy Carlos, he was able to have these albums released in the U.S on RCA. So he got a major label release and huge like top of the billboard charts with these albums, which is so funny to think about now. So like 1974, right. like imagine a world right now where this type of album is at the top of the charts. That's just so hard for me to imagine. Mm -hmm. But it made him uh, kind of put into this category with the record labels where they were like, okay, do another, do another, do another. <laughs> Uh, what other composer do you want to cover? So he ended up making the majority of the albums that you'll find are cover albums of classical composers, but he kept getting like more and more out there. Like his approaches and his techniques and his arrangements got like way off the rails. I really appreciated that about his story. Yeah. Like the fact that he seemed to, he was like, sure. I'll do this guy, yeah. but I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do yeah, it. Yeah, he kind of seemed okay with understanding that the business of the music industry was that way. He always seemed like he had a way to like stay ahead of him. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, he was like, sure, I got a few tricks up my sleeve, you know, that I'm going to use when I, when I do that, you know, like there's, it's almost like he saw it as a challenge. Like, how can I continue to grow 
as a sound designer and as a you know kind of free thinking uh, musician while still you know meeting my uh, deadlines for the label. You know, yeah, and kind of packaging it the way they're expecting and then throwing right. in enough surprises. Yes. So the, the follow-up to Dancing on Snowflakes, which was the WC covers, was Planets in 1976, which is my personal favorite of his. And Still I need on. to spend more time. His catalog is really, it's really vast. It's extensive. Yeah. And every, like I said, every time I listen, I hear something new that I like. But personally, obviously, we like the cosmic themes. <laughs> Yeah. Planets is very, very obviously cosmic. Most of his stuff sounds pretty cosmic, but this one is, um, right. you know, on the nose. Mm -hmm. It is Gustav Holt's The Planets um, suite, and he covered it, and it's each of the planets. This, uh, this album specifically, he kind of twisted things around. He took themes from different parts of the suite and mixed them up. Um, but this, uh, the one called Mars, he specifically explained that he used some radio technology to um, make some noise and interference that sounded like maybe a transmission from aliens mm -hmm. was happening. Um, and I thought that was really cool because uh, something I forgot to say earlier was that when they first started getting the um, the music they were hearing over the radio during the war, so this is in the 40s when the U.S. occupation was happening in Japan, they would listen to the radio to see you know where bombings were happening um, and if they needed to flee, and they were getting interference from the U.S. occupation uh, that was transmitting Western music for the troops, mm. and he said it sounded like music from outer space. It sounded like a transmission was coming in from aliens because they didn't quite understand what was happening. The interference, it was sounds they had never heard before. So and he thought he was going to get, like, you know, some kickback. He thought he was going to get, like... So, yeah, so he kind of... This is probably, what, almost 30, 30 years later. He's taking this same idea of transmissions from outer space and making them himself and using them on his recordings. But he went to like the top of Mount Fuji, right? Or not necessarily. He the went top, like halfway up. He went halfway up. He was explaining something about how there's like there was a military some base. Radio transmissions happening at these stations along And he Mount wasn't Fuji. supposed to be broadcasting. Yeah. And he thought that It was like a super defense system that was They would hear there. like what he was trying to to broadcast for his own recording purposes. And they would actually tell him that he, you know, they would come find him and arrest yeah, him or something. Yeah, he was really worried about that. But nothing ever happened. So. But he also seemed to get a <laughs> kick out of the idea that of imagining exactly the, yeah. the people hearing what he was doing and thinking that and aliens were transmitting. <laughs> not realizing it was coming from him, Yeah. but assuming that it was a third party. Yeah. Is there some secret, like top secret file somewhere in the Japanese defense right, yeah. system that has like this day we heard alien transmissions yeah there was that day back in whenever that <laughs> yeah somebody's got a file on that there was a breach <laughs> so i liked that there was this element of transmissions from outer space on the album that's about planets he was really thoughtful in that way yeah. and obviously the the original composition is quite good as well um i was listening to it to remind myself of what the original sounds like. And it reminds me of what, so the original composition, um, The Planet Suite by Gustav Holst, um, is arranged for orchestra. And it reminds me of Star yeah. Wars, which is a good tie-in because he also made a cover of the Star Wars theme. <laughs> what didn't he cover? Um, so then he made an album, I, this is his next one, so like every two years he's doing an album. His next one was called Cosmos. The, the first track on Cosmos is the Star Wars theme that he covers, and it's really quite good. It's sort of like, when I think of Star Wars, I don't, I know I'm supposed to think of the theme and it's an orchestra, but I want it to be Moog music. And he did a really good job. I think one of the other things, besides the sound design, um, that he did a really good job of was picking out the key elements to, 
you know, make sure that he included in terms of his major melody and harmony. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't include every little... He didn't do it note for note. He did get into digital technology very early on. I heard someone say it was about 1984 mm -hmm. that he incorporated digital technology into his home studio. Um, and he quickly um, reverted back mm -hmm. and brought more analog in um, because he did feel like he could not get the richness of especially because most of the work he did, he was covering or orchestral arrangements. So he's, um, you know, trying to create the sound of a violin or an oboe or bassoon with a synthesizer. And he felt that in order to get a really rich layered tone, he needed the analog equipment to be in the mix because digital is so transparent. Um, he said it was like walking on thin ice and when he talked very poetically about how a violin is made, you know, originally it's organic materials that are being scraped against each other. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be noise and it's artifacts. Horse hair on gut sheep, string. Sheep guts, sheep yeah. Sheep gut, yeah. Um, that in order to really replicate that sound and feeling, he needed some tape hiss. He needed layering, you know, he needed noise that he used to sculpt like a sculptor. Yeah, in other words, like, you weren't going to convince that guy, you know, that digital is uh, the same or fine or, or nothing's missing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? He, he he brought it up, we didn't. He disagreed. <laughs> I know we always right. bring up the digital versus analog wars, but he did it this time. Yeah, he definitely, you know, in the challenge of digital versus analog, you know, chose analog and, you know, very intentionally went back to it. Ah, but that's a really good uh, point to then pivot to his love of stereo, quadraphonic, and pyramid sound. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about um, that. So apparently one of the big reasons why he got into electronic music is because he was arranging music for orchestras at the NHK radio in Japan. That was, they did film and TV and all that stuff. <sighs> um, and they got very early on into stereo. So he started hearing the arrangements he was writing and compositions he was making for orchestra, for film and TV, in stereo. And it, like, blew his mind. And so then when he started getting to electronic music, he very early on was um, making these recordings for the quadraphonic experience. So he started arranging, I know, he started arranging... Don't go to quad and for, expect me not to say anything. For quad, which was very popular in the 70s. And then kind of, I didn't hear about it until like now it's coming back again. But he, um, he did get into some digital like software that would allow him to arrange for uh, a spatial sound experience. And away we go. Well, the reason why it was popular in the <laughs> 70s was because, you know, they made four-track reel-to-reels. Right. And they could do quad no problem. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were four-track, four um, you know, tapes, quad tapes put out, you know, that would just use all four tracks of a quad reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape machine. And then, because the vinyl format was more popular... They figured out how to, you know, uh, encode four tracks of music on a, on a record, and that people have quadraphonic turntables, hmm. um, and that there were a lot of records during this particular time uh, that were made for that format. But it wasn't. It was, you know, definitely wasn't popular. It was definitely kind of like, um, you know, laser disc versus. <laughs> VHS oh, or DVD, you know, it was kind of like a, a flop of a format. Mm -hmm. um, but it existed nonetheless. And I love the idea of music, you know, like popular music being released in a quadraphonic uh, format because. I want to hear sound swirling around the room. But apparently he went a step further and he did five. And he called it pyramid sound. Gotcha. 
So apparently in the 80s, he then got into um, doing these performances all over the world that he called SoundCloud performances. Two separate words. Not the platform where you can upload your latest DJ mix. But <laughs> um, he traveled the world as sort of a DJ. And apparently this is how Stevie Wonder heard about Tomita and got obsessed with him. Mm. And Michael Jackson as well. I could see. So he became very famous for these concerts. Apparently there were fireworks and lasers involved and it was just really over the top. Like 100,000 people would show up. Huge, huge deal. Was that big in the 80s? Okay, so apparently he would sit in a pyramid and he would have like a group of live drummers. Um, he would have, let's see, like lasers and a light show and firework but i'm like oh my gosh we're just at the 80s and he lived to be 80. um so we didn't get as far as i wanted to but um he did spend the rest of his life i mean up until he died in 2016 he was still composing for uh film and tv and anime and he was also developing technology that to me is a little bit quirky but seems very cutting edge and interesting in the uh, Japanese Context. concert world. Um, he, I guess, invented this like digital person mm. that responds to a conductor and sings. Hatsune Miku is a Vocaloid software voice bank developed by Krypton Future Media. It's a 16 year old girl <laughs> with turquoise hair. And is that his company? I guess it's his company or he's involved with it somehow, but it's like his thing. Um, and he called it a Vocaloid, um, which I guess is just like a further like futuristic development of Seems his offensive. vocalizing <laughs> with the synthesizer that no one had done before. She's like on the screen. No, it's like a sort of like a hologram almost. Yeah, yeah, a hologram. She's like on stage performing like a real person. This is with a band. The one we saw, she was with an orchestra. Right. Um, yeah, and this is some crazy stuff. But this is what he was doing. This is the next level future stuff he was working on. We hope that you get as excited as we are about exploring Tomita and his immense body of work. It's going to be a very, I'm gonna be in a very cosmic place this week with his music. Definitely, yeah. And, uh, I'm stoked. Thanks to Steve Apostolides for this background music. Stay cosmic, stay healthy, stay connected, and uh, say hi and let us know how you're doing.